This week's video is brought to you by Aurora. Age of Desolation, Ghostfire Gaming's latest 5th edition Kickstarter project. Aurora is a campaign setting for 5e, which consists of five shattered realms, each of which is ruled over by a dragon lord. Each of those realms have their dragon lord's regional effects ratcheted up to 11. This means that to be able to explore Aurora, First, you must survive it. And so there are new exploration and survival mechanics introduced in the book, which bring that exploration pillar of play back to the forefront of D&D 5e. You can check out Aurora through the link in the description to this video. Go consider backing and we will see you in Aurora. You can't help the gleeful grin that comes to your face as the mortal presses their bloody thumbprint to the paper. And with this signature, your influence grows, and so too does your master's. Your foe is fire, but you are the storm. You will wash them away with your roiling, tempestuous power. Never mind those caught in your fury, you are simply a force of nature. A pang of fear twists your gut in the same moment you feel that familiar hunger. You could tear the mortal in front of you in twain with your bare hands and shower in their blood. But your friends are watching, and what would they think knowing your secret? Have you ever desired to play a D&D &D character that has a monstrous secret or perhaps a side of themselves that they battle with for control? Or perhaps you play a character that has ambitions for power and doesn't care what prices need to be paid in their ambition for cosmic dominance, which sounds like most player characters, to be honest. Transformations from the Grim Hollow campaign setting offer players the opportunity to explore that less virtuous side of themselves and experience what it's like to play a player character that is truly monstrous. Transformations were designed for characters to battle with or embrace in a dark fantasy campaign and they perfectly represent the dark fantasy themes of moral ambiguity or internal conflict. If you want your next player character to suffer a transformation, or perhaps you're a GM who wants to explore using transformations, here are three of my favourite transformation and class combinations. Because, of course, when you take on the traits of a transformation, you also still gain advantage from your class abilities, which means that these can be optimised both mechanically but also narratively and thematically. My name is Ben Byrne, and here are three of my favourite transformation class combinations. <laughs> Number one, a warlock that is transforming into a fiend. Fiendish contracts are a mainstay of Dungeons and Dragons, typically between a warlock and their fiendish patron. What if you could be the one drafting the contracts instead, binding mortals to your will rather than being purely of service to another? Thematically, this combination just makes delicious sense, especially if you already have a pact with a fiend, which means that you become your patron's apprentice or subcontractor, and with every mortal you're able to bind with a contract, you grow the influence of your master as well. Or perhaps you wish to get out from under your master's control, and so you're signing your own contracts to build your own power so that one day, maybe you become the master and force them to sign a contract with with you. Alternatively, a weapon that fell from the Nine Hells into your possession, which is slowly corrupting your soul and appearance, could work just as well thematically for a warlock that's transforming into a fiend, making the Hexblade Pact just as fitting. Mechanically, this combination also synergizes well because you need to convince mortals to sign contracts if you're going to gain new powers. And to do so, you're probably gonna need a pretty high charisma score. Also, every contract that you get signed gives you new powers that do synergize pretty well with your Eldritch Invocations. If you're a melee-based warlock, perhaps packed to the blade, you can add your charisma score to your melee-based attacks, both spell and weapon, which means that you don't need to take Agonizing Blast. Or you could 
throw leathery wings and give yourself a fly speed instead. These contracts also offer delicious role-playing opportunities. And if you are the GM for a campaign that has someone undergoing the Fiend transformation, make them work to get those contracts signed. Make them wine and dine the mortal that they're trying to lure into signing these contracts. Learn what the mortal's deepest, darkest desires are, and then summon a quill from thin air and pass it over to sign the contract. To get these contracts to yield the power to the fiend, the mortal needs to enter into them understanding all of the costs involved. Of course, as your soul becomes corrupted, so too does your appearance. You may choose for your character to grow great horns, get glowing orange eyes and have red leathery skin as their appearance changes and is twisted. If mortals ever see your true appearance, they may become automatically hostile towards you. The Eldritch Invocation Mask of many faces makes it easier to hide your immortal appearance and make it easier for you to be able to fool mortals into signing these contracts. Combination number two, a sorcerer who is transforming into a primordial. Magic courses through your body, but it is barely contained. You are a roiling source of pure primal magic. With every spell you cast, you become less mortal as the primal powers of creation reshape you. Many transformations are caused by a horrific moment or event which befell the player character, such as getting mauled on by a werewolf. As a sorcerer who is transforming into a primordial, this might just be a natural evolution of your powers manifesting themselves. You use your magic to try to help the downtrodden and vanquish great evils, but the tragedy is with every spell you cast, you feel more and more detached from your allies as you become less humane and more elemental, more of a force of nature. Eventually, you're going to be reduced to nothing more than a silent living stone atop a grassy hill or a whisper on the wind like an echo. The flaws of the primordial transformation play very fittingly into this narrative. Because you have disadvantage on death saving throws, as the primal powers which give you your abilities try to pull your soul back into their realms of existence. You also find it harder to rest in civilized lands because the bonds of civilization mean less and less to you as you become detached from your humanity. With great sacrifice comes great power. You draw your powers, you get mechanical buffs from the four elements, fire, earth, wind, water, not heart. That's not an element. Air focuses on ranged attacks and obviously thematically synergizes very well with a storm sorcerer. Earth is mostly protective, providing temporary hit points to your allies and could synergize very well with a resilient shadow sorcerer. Fire obviously focuses on doing fire damage and this could synergize really well with a draconic sorcerer who comes from a red or gold dragon bloodline. And water provides buffs to healing, which could be capitalized on very much by a divine soul sorcerer. Or, of course, you could choose mechanical buffs from all of the four elements and become a wild magic sorcerer of unhindered roiling elemental magic. We have with that. Combination number three, a barbarian who is transforming into a vampire. It's not a secret that I love vampires and the thematic role that they play in human mythology. I did a whole video over here about how to present vampires as a GM, as an enemy in your D&D campaign. But even in that video, I said it was a fantastic idea to feature a transformation in your campaign of a player character turning into a vampire. Vampires work best when they appear as someone of class and decorum and civility on the surface, but they this is simply a facade for the roiling, hungering beast that lies within. And there is no better D&D class for representing this dichotomy than the rage-filled barbarian. The thematic lure of role-playing a vampire in a tabletop RPG is an exercise in battling with your own inner demons because you are caught between that choice of giving in to the internal hunger, which never goes away, is always haunting you, but also not really wanting to harm anybody else. You, you don't want to hurt others. You are trapped 
between your need for blood and violence and the desire not to wreak havoc and chaos on those around you. But the tragedy is that both choices lead to utter madness and the only peace you truly have left is that moment where you lose control of yourself and give in to the inner demon. This internal struggle is played out at the D&D table in those moments where you choose whether or not to rage. Because raging represents that moment where you do lose control and everybody sees the monster that you truly are and believe yourself to be. As a vampire barbarian, your rage is something you only surrender to in the most dire of circumstances. Because finally giving in to your blood rage and showing everybody around you the monster that you truly are inside is as terrifying for you as it is for all of them. To become a vampire in the Grim Hollow campaign guide, there is a prerequisite that you have a dexterity score of at least 13, and dexterity is also used to generate a save DC for some of your vampiric abilities. This shouldn't be a huge hurdle for a barbarian. It's obviously not your prime ability score, strength is, but dexterity could be up there. And you also get a plus two bonus to your dexterity once you've become a vampire, helping you generate a higher save DC. But of course you are driven by an insatiable need for blood and violence and this is represented through the vampire abilities called Blood Fury, which are a set of mechanical bonuses which are fueled by fury points. And you get these fury points by dealing damage in melee combat, which you're going to be doing a lot. These points allow you to do extra things like deal extra melee damage or teleport around as a cloud of mist. And this means that raging in combat doesn't seem as necessary every combat and allows you to role play out that theme of not wanting to show everybody else your inner demon. However, when the situation does call for a true monster and there is no option left but to let out your internal blood rage, your fury point abilities are still usable while raging so you will feel like you are truly unleashing the monster within. Of course, as you grow in strength as a vampire, so too do your vampiric flaws. You will become weak to sunlight. You will become weak to running water. You will need an invitation to enter into other people's homes. And always gnawing at you is that thirst for blood, which if you try to ignore, will have dire consequences for you and possibly your fellow party members. Your appearance slowly becomes more and more horrifying and it becomes harder to hide the truth of what your nature is. You can appear more mortal by concentrating on your appearance as if you were concentrating on a spell, but of course you can't concentrate during a rage and this plays into that narrative we've developed where when you release your control, you truly transform into something monstrous. And those are three of my favorite transformation class combinations. What combinations have you found work really well in your games? Have you played a transformation before? Let us know how it went in the comments down below. And if you think there's a combination that we missed that works really well, both mechanically and thematically. Of course, give this video a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel, we'd really appreciate it because we will be back next week with more D&D Dark Fantasy.